Charity. And uh, next week we'll cover on demonology. You notice that every week is a new topic altogether and 14 different topics that we cover, that we're going to cover. So let's look at the Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 1. And look at the laws of prosperity. We have to see the foundation, the laws behind the laws are the foundation. See what the Pharisees and Sadducees made was the heart of God. God created the laws. Behind the laws uh, is God. The laws reveal to us the nature of God, the character of God, the attributes of God. So the laws are for purpose. The same with the laws of finances, there is a foundation. And the foundation is upon God's heart, God's nature. God is not poor. His name in itself means unlimited God, Almighty, El Shaddai, He who is and who is to come. His name itself is prosperity. So some people do not believe in prosperity. Just because they think it's a new teaching that comes along, they think that it's not in the Bible. But there are many new things that are in the Bible that uh, have been written inside. But today, we are beginning to discover them. And we are continuing to discover them until Jesus comes. So those who do not believe in prosperity, my subject rate of God, because God's name is prosperity. If you don't believe in prosperity, you don't believe in God. God's name himself is Jehovah Jireh. There are seven redemption names. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shekinu, etc. There are seven of them. And among one of those names is God who provides. Let's look at Genesis. God created this world. First to the sixth day. And every time God made something, created something, He also said something. In verse 12, verse 10 onwards, God called the dry land of and the gathering together of the waters, He called sea. And God saw that it was good. Verse 12. The earth brought forth grass, herb, that you see, trees, etc. And God saw that it was good. And when Looking down at the time when God started creating all the uh, great sea creatures and every living thing in verse 21, the last line says, And God saw that it was, everybody, good. And verse 25, last verse, And God saw that it was good. And the Bible moves on to verse 29, God saw everything, and He says it shall be for food, and it was the sixth day. And look at verse 31, the last verse. Then God saw everything that He had made, and in it, it was very good. That was the conclusion. See, God has made all the different uh, plants, trees, animals, fish, and God concludes by making man to dominate all his creation, and he said it was very good. Then when he came, after man came into the picture, then was the Garden of Eden, there was no poverty. God never made man to be poor. Man had an abundant supply. In fact, this was what God told them. 
in uh, chapter 1, verse 29. I have given you. He has already blessed them. He says, I have given you every herb, you seed, every tree whose fruit you see. To you it shall be for food. God has blessed them, given them everything. There were probably millions of trees there. There is only one tree that God said not to eat. And there were many others that God has given. They had more than enough. And moreover, the trees never die at that time. They were perpetual trees that lived eternally too. And everything was prosperity. But when sin came into the world, when Adam and Eve stopped following God and decided to follow the devil and his way, decided to depend on their own strength instead of depending upon God's blessing. Instead of looking to God, they start looking for themselves. The fall was not only Satan and the serpent involved, it was their own decision. They wanted to be wise in their own eyes, in their own strength. They wanted to be independent from God, which was not God's will for them to be that way. And so the moment they sinned in chapter 3 and they pulled away from God in Genesis chapter 3, poverty came. When sin came, poverty came. And this was what happened to the men in Genesis chapter 3, God says in verse 17, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's the source of our poverty. The moment men fell and were separated from God, there were no more union with God, God said, it's not going to be easy. You're going to struggle to survive. Where before you don't have to struggle, you can concentrate on enjoyment. Do you know there's a difference between enjoyment and struggling? Many of you seated right here and listening to this word probably have a lot of potential in many areas. But because of the need on this earth to work hard and earn your living, you do not and you are not able to spend time in certain areas that you would have to develop yourself. Some of you who are very good stenographers or typists could have been very good musicians. You may have loved music, but I mean, you, you don't have time to develop in a, that area. And even good musicians may be so busy performing, trying to earn their living, instead of developing to the fullness the talent that they have. And we know that many talents are good, but today they don't bring money. So people don't go into those areas. They, don't, they are not able to make a living with their talent, so they go on to something else. Then it's why it will be so wonderful in heaven when everything is provided by God, you no more worry about food, clothing, and shelter, and you no more have to sort of be responsible in your day-to-day -day activities in food, clothing, and shelter. You're worrying to stop even down here. Where all you can concentrate in heaven is developing what God has made you and made you to be. 
And he is concentrating on developing all those different av- avenues and different aspects that God has placed inside you to bring glory to the Almighty God. It will be a wonderful time in heaven. On this earth, we are sort of limited to only certain things. I don't know about you, but for myself, I love music. But God has called me to minister, so I try not to spend too much time in that area. We cannot do a thousand things on earth. We can only do one main thing, what God wants us to do. When we get to heaven, then we no more souls to be saved. Then we can go to other areas in heaven. Things that we would love to do, the deep desire in, we can develop in other areas. And today, in the same way, in the field of architecture, they could actually build more beautiful than what they can today. But the limitations are cost and finances. So nobody dare to, and dare to go all out. If, if people are to say there's unlimited finances, they will be able to build great architectures, even in our limited way today, that bring such, that, that symbolize great beauty above what man is able to do. So I'm showing you that on this earth, the limitation has always been there because of the curse. You have to struggle to earn your living. Adam has to struggle, but before there were no thistles and thorns. Now he has to struggle as he has to work hard with his jungle, plow, and while he's trying, while he's eating his sweat, God says, it's a struggle to live now because of the curse. So then it's how it all started. And God, through Jesus Christ, wants to bring us back into that blessing realm. Do you know that when the Lord Jesus came down to this planet Earth, uh, He never struggled for living? Why? Because He walked in the realm that Adam walked. He didn't even have a savings account. In those days, they have banks too, but the banks are the, what do you call them? The Sakya. What do you call them? Sakya. Oh, I see. So that was the bank in those days. They are not as developed as our banks today. Jesus never had any accounts with them. When you need to pay taxes, his banker was a thief. And all, all he had to do was go to the pig. Uh, he sent Peter to preach out of it. So it's remarkable that when Jesus came, in a world that's struggling to earn a living, he just came and he walked on this planet up in the realm of Adam without any struggle. Wherever he has a need, God supplies. And he's trying to tell us, come and walk at that level where I walk. And when he preached in Matthew 6, he was saying, forget about the things the Gentiles seek after that they worry over, come and live with me, Jesus said, in a realm that I live, where God will be able to supply every need of yours if you will seek his kingdom first. Jesus wants us to get into that realm. And God from the Old Testament has been seeking to restore us back to that realm of blessing instead of the realm of struggling. There are only two realms you can live when we talk about finances. You're either struggling or you're being blessed. They move from the realm of struggling to the realm of blessing. Just enjoyment. Where God said it is good. When Adam came before sin came, he was enjoying. Everything was there to enjoy. He didn't have to work. All he had to do is pray and worship. No tongues, no titles. He could say at that time, no stress. It was all nice and easy. That is the way God wanted it to be. Deuteronomy chapter 28, this is the old covenant. God says, verse 11 to 13, And the Lord will grant you how much good? A little good? How much is plenty? A lot. The Lord will grant you plenty of good. 
We just keep it in detail. God says plenty of good. Plenty of blessing. Plenty of good. In the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord sought to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you His good treasure to heaven to give the rain to your land in His season and to bless all the work of your hand. There is no failure. It says, everything that your hand set unto will prosper. You shall lend to many nations, but you cannot borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. Talk about commandments. So God tells the people that He's going to make a covenant with them. And in this covenant, God has His part to bless. They have their part to obey. And if they will walk in God's covenant, they will move from struggling into blessing. Struggling and blessing are two different ways to living. You are either struggling or you are either being blessed. And God says, come into the avenue where I want to bless you. He wanted to make a covenant with the Israelites. And those who keep their covenant with him, like David, and like Solomon in his early days, God bless them. When God bless, you are able to receive more than you could by your own strength or wisdom. So definitely we, we want to see the foundation. Why does God do all these things? Because He is a good God. If we earthly father, parents and mothers, would desire good for our children, how much more our Father in heaven? We must eradicate this traditional thinking that poor is holy. That poverty is spirituality. It is the devil's doctrine. Before the devil can steal from you, he has to give you a wrong doctrine. Before he can steal help from you, he has to try to convince you that God sent sickness. Before he can steal your blessing, he has to convince you that they don't belong to you. So traditional churches have a concept of poverty. To be poor is to be holy. To be poor is to be spiritual. And so while they are living and enjoying their so-called poverty, the devil is using all the silver and gold in this world to propagate his evil, to turn the world against God. While the Christians are hiding themselves in caves, hermits, in the dark ages. Well, the world is going to hell. But when Christians began to realize that no, this world belongs to God. And instead of letting the devil use all the silver and gold, the Christians should rise up and take what belongs to God and bring it into the kingdom of God and use it in the kingdom of God to propagate the kingdom of God on this planet earth. That is God's nature. This is the foundation of prosperity. You must understand God loves you. He is a good God. He is our Father. It is for us in His heart to bless us. The same God who made the Garden of Eden is the same God today who, who is our Father who makes us. It's the same God who do not, does not want us to suffer the way Adam and Eve suffered after the death. He wants us to enjoy instead of struggle. To enjoy Him and His blessing instead of struggle. Know this foundation. And the second area of the foundation refers to the New Covenant, the New Testament. Here we are all in the curse of the poverty. And there is not a blessing. The only way for us to get there is not by our own work, it's by Jesus Christ. 
einen Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich you through his poverty might become rich now, some people say this is only spiritual but you look at the context chapter 8 verse 1 and 2 and 3 talks about money Verse 4 continues to talk about money, the gift, and many things to the king. And uh, verse 8 and 9 continue talking about the same thing. And then the very next verse, verse 11, 12, 13 continues to talk about money. Verse 15 continues to talk about money. And uh, verse uh, 16, 17, 18 continues to talk about money. In fact, chapter 8 and chapter 9 talks about money. So there's no way you can move out of the team that he's trying to present here that Jesus was made poor so that we can be made rich. So Jesus took our poverty upon himself that through his poverty you might become rich. In the new covenant, Prosperity is not a earned credit. Prosperity is a gift of His love. Just like Adam and Eve did not earn the Garden of Eden, they were given the privilege to live in the Garden of Eden. In the same way, Jesus is our prosperity. And prosperity is a gift he gives by his grace. Grace is not something you earn. Grace does not depend on you, on your person, on who you are, or on what you have done. Grace is something that depends on the giver is based on the giver. But there are certain things you have to do to acknowledge grace. Certain things you have to do to acknowledge grace. For example, I can take a $10, right? And I can say, right, this $10 is to be given freely. Does not depend on what a person has. Does not depend on who the person is. Does not depend on what a person has done. And I said, here is a gift that is given to you. It is different from paying or wages. If I said, but uh, David and I said uh, would you do the job uh, within three days and we will pay you and after three days he finishes the job he comes for the payment and I pay him that is not great that is wages there is something earned there is something he has done but if I say, this is great, that means before he has done anything, in fact, he may not even be deserving it, and then it's given, that's great. I want to eradicate from our mind the thinking of earning, earning, earning. You see, we live in a world where we have to please, where we have to earn, where we have to uh, uh, do things to, to, to get it. We live in a different world, different lifestyle. In the garden or Eden, you don't do anything to get. All you have to do is praise God and just receive. But in the world, we have been brought up that before we receive something, we have to do something. We're going to talk about the laws, but the laws behind the laws are the, is this principle of grace. Where it's freely given. 
But grace demands a response. Jesus died for your sins. And you do not believe that Jesus died for your sins and do not receive what he has done, you have not received grace yet. Grace means a response. All you have to do is say, thank you, I take it. Praise God. Now, here's ten dollars. And uh, whoever wants to just come and get it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this this sermon cost me ten dollars. But I want you to see the difference between grace and earning. Grace depends on the work of the person who says. Grace depends on the giver's side. The only part the person who receives is just to take it. Do you know that it's not a gift until you take it? You can believe, you can sit there in your chair and believe that, yes, I'm saying it with my mouth, and I'm saying whoever wants it, you can take it, but you can still be seated unless you respond, it's not yours. And Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Jesus died on the cross for your poverty. And He's telling you that He has taken your poverty, He's giving you riches now, He says, respond and receive. He says that, I have done this for you. All you have to do is say, thank you, Lord. What did you do? Remember what Philip did? Praise God, he remembers. Say, thank you. And I want you to know those of you are looking and staring at me. Eh? It's, it's for real. <laughs> so you just don't believe the word. Sometimes we treat God that way. That's why I told you this sermon is costing me ten dollars. <laughs> it's for real. Now when God says something, the word of God says that Jesus Christ took our poverty. And he says that this is his gift of his grace to our lives. There's only one thing you have to do. You have to believe him. You have to believe he did it for you. If Philip did not believe my words, he will not set up. If you don't believe my words, you will not set up. You have to believe in the word of the one who said it. And God's word tells you that Jesus became poor so that we can become rich. His word declares it. It is based upon the works of Jesus. All that you receive today in life as a believer, it's a result of the works of Jesus. No wonder the Bible tells us that today, unlike the Old Testament, we have a lot of thanksgiving to do. What else can you do when Jesus has finished everything? Well, we can at least say thank you. We can at least say, we worship you, Lord, for it. And then it's like the Bible in the New Testament. Do you notice how many times in the New Testament the epistles, it tells us thanksgiving and supplication always go together. Praising Him going, goes together. The New Testament emphasizes praising and thanksgiving more than the Old. What is the reason? Because in the New Covenant, everything is done in Christ. Tell me what else can you do? There's not much to do. Except obey those laws that are flowing it unto you and just thank Him. Thanksgiving. Worship Him. That's the foundation of prosperity. It's based on the work of Christ. Now, with a physical $10, it's easy to reach out and take it. In the realm of the Spirit, Jesus is in the spirit realm, God is in the spirit realm. We have to learn how to move into the spirit realm and make it difficult for some. That is why I emphasize the law of tithing, the law of saving, and all these various laws apply to reaching into the realm of the spirit. From the, it's a, it is a natural act by which we reach into the realm of the spirit to draw and to receive what Jesus has done for us. The foundation of prosperity 
is the work of Jesus Christ. If you could believe that, you are going to live in a different realm. Every day you just thank you. You just thank Jesus. You have been made rich in Christ. You have been. You believe what he has done for you. You receive what he has done for you. That's all. As we go into the law of finances, the second part we want to touch on is the motivation. The motivation of the law of finances, that is the purpose of money itself. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, tells us about money. Let's uh, start reading from verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is the root of all, A double L, all kinds of evil. Money in itself is neutral. But the love of it makes it evil. So God is not against money. Otherwise we ought to get rid of all our money and don't use it. But God is against the love of money which is an attitude, not a commodity. Money, money is a commodity. But it's our attitude to that commodity that Jesus that the Word of God is telling us that will determine whether it's evil or good. The wrong handling of money, the love of money, is the root of all evil. And I believe if you understand this truth, you'll be able to move into prosperity, but how vital it is to emphasize over and over again the purpose of money. For that, we look at the Gospel of Mark at the incident of the widow. Very famous widow because of her. We all know about the widow with the two mice. That is in page 2 of your notes. Looking at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus said opposite the treasury, and saw how the people put money into the treasury. So the first thing that we know is that Jesus sat on the treasury and everyone who passed by put in their tithes and their offerings. Now it is quite interesting to see how Jesus will purposely sit there right next to the box where the people put the money. I'm sure all of you will find it very funny if we do away with offering by soul and we only use the box and you see me sitting next to the box there. You will feel very funny and in those days they don't even provide envelopes. So, Jesus was just sitting there and watching. Remember Jesus is very famous at that time. Everyone knows it is Jesus the healer, the teacher, the rabbi. And Jesus was sitting right next to the box, looking. And today Jesus is sitting next to you when you bring an offering in, a, in your tithe to him. You know, some people over-spiritualize certain things until they don't realize that it, God is interested in our giving in how we handle money. God is interested to know how you handle your finances as much as He is interested in how you handle your prayer life and your devotion life. He's interested in how you handle your money. After all, finances and money is something that every one of us deals with. He's very much interested in how we handle money. How a person handles money will reflect how a person is going to handle spiritual things. 
Jesus wants to see our responsibility in that area. Today, he is sitting in our hearts watching how we handle our financial life. So the first point we want to draw for is that God is interested in our handling of money. He is interested in our bringing tithes and giving offerings. Vitally interested. It's something that he looks at. Just imagine, all, all of you work hard at various jobs. Some of you could be accountants, some of you could be clerks, some of you could be doing various kind of jobs. You put in all your hard work, your eight hours a day, taking the bus all the way to the job, and at the end of the month, all you have is dollars and cents. That money that you receive represents all the effort that you have put in. Now that could be used in exchange for other commodities. But that packet that you receive at the end of the month, or that check, all your hard work represents all your hours of sweat and labor. It all comes down to the dollars and the cents. Surely, what you do with that commodity called money, which you put all your hard work into, is going to reflect on you. So Gary at the point that God is not interested in our finances, He is interested in our finances. He watches how you balance your accounts every month. Sitting in your heart. Watching you. He's still today sitting inside or rather standing wherever you want. And he's still watching, looking at people putting in the offering. And it says there that as he was sitting there he saw how the people put in the money. I mean, there were all kinds of people that put in. It did not say that he saw what they put in, but he saw how they put it in. Their attitude. He was interested, God is interested in the attitude of giving. He watches your motivation. Your heart, whether it is love or not. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that He gave. You cannot love without giving, but you can give without loving. First Corinthians tells us that sometimes a person can give all and then all that they have, but have not love, it profits them nothing. So God is watching how we are giving. And as the people march in during the time of uh, bringing the offering unto God, some of those who are rich, they will make a parade. I don't know how they will make a parade. Rather they have a few outriders going before them, going trumpet, pa 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 And then those very rich will come. And they would take whatever gold that they had and they would pa 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 boom and everyone would say woo I mean they made a great display now this is something that was present in, at that time it was something that is that is real that Jesus is encounter in fact in the Sermon on the Mount uh, he talked about in the Gospel of Matthew how sometimes people give arms in order to get attention. Wrong motive. Let's turn to Matthew for a few moments. Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said in chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed 
maybe in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. See, God loves people who give because of their love for him. And then look at this, the two verses before that in verse uh, 2. Uh, verse 1. Verse 1 sounds interesting. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before man. In other words, you don't do it to get recognition for man. You don't give to manipulate. In fact, people who give to manipulate, we would rather return the offering. There have been a few times in my ministry when people have given to manipulate, I said, no, thank you. We don't like people to control if they want to use finances to do that. Wrong motivation. That is why if you ever give an offering, don't give it with pride. Don't give an offering and, and, and tie it to yourself. That is manipulation. That is trying to control using money. When you give an offering, when you give your time, no strings attached. It's given, it's given. Because God told you to give. You don't like strings. People who give with strings attached every time end up flying you like a kite. <laughs> So here Jesus said, don't do your charitable deeds in front of men. And what I was saying to you about blowing trumpet is something real. Jesus is not making this up. It is happening in those days of the world too. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet. Don't send the outriders before you. And uh, everyone knows, oh, it's Mr. Big Giver. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, they already have their reward. What is the reward? The attention that they get. See, God is interested in our motives for giving. Doesn't want us to give for any reason. As much as possible, if you want to give, if you really mean it for God, an anonymous one is always the best. Hello there. That is why in our church, we do not take down your name. Because we believe that your giving is between you and God. We do have programs, foundation, faith foundation, etc. But once you feel like God, all we do is pray for you. We won't even send reminders we won't even tell anybody. We won't even look to you. We look to God. But that is a relief of your faith. That's why it's called faith foundation. Because you are doing it unto God. Unto God. Now, as long as you know that people will not be affected by your finances, then you can go ahead. I mean... If you are one of those who do collect receipts, I mean, it's good. You keep a proper account. But sometimes when you give to certain individuals who you know they will be affected towards you, keep it anonymous for their sake. There's a certain brother, he's not in our country, but he's in Australia. He has been giving to several ministries and said, he one day sat down and told me, I have a problem. When I give to this and this ministry, they end, end up giving me more attention and trying to be more friendly to me. And he says, I have this problem. I don't know what to do. This, I mean, there's something wrong with these people. They should not start doing anything because of finances. So the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, give it anonymous. So the person will not keep looking to man, they will keep looking to God. But on the side of the giver, your motives are important. Why do you give? What motivates you to give? Jesus was sitting down and watching how they give. 
Do you know how the widow did? It says in Mark chapter 12, many who were rich in verse 41 put in much. How did they know they put in much? Because they've been blowing the trumpet. They must be, you know, here, 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 here. Boom, it goes down. And then one after the other. So everyone could see. And then it tells us here that the widow came. I mean, after all the attention that has been given to this guy, here comes the widow. Remember, she's just wanting to obey God. It was time, the time of the collection, the Jewish collection of the special offering. So here comes the widow. She only had about what today would be equivalent to about two cents. And she takes the two cents. I mean, in, in the midst of all these people there who have been saying, whoa, whoa, and when those people put in much, some of them may have given a clap offering. <laughs> After blowing all the trumpets, it was, it was having a, they were having a hilarious time. Here comes the widow with all those clap offerings and all this attention given to those who put in much. She's very shy now, blushing all the way as she goes there. But she still wanted to do something for God. She had only the two cents in her hand, two mice. Then she goes here. She was just very, very, very uh, shy about the whole thing. And she just put it in and quickly go out. In fact, she was so shy that the Bible tells us there that she came in verse 42 and she threw it in. See the word threw it in? She came, she placed it, she just quickly. It, it, it shows the quickness of a giving. And Jesus was sitting there, remember, she's just very shy about it. That she only had two cents. All the others probably came with their wagons, <laughs> donkey loads of gold. Remember those days they don't use paper money. It was real solid. When they give an offering, they also have a sound. Pong! goes down. And here comes that little Jesus was sitting there. She was very shy about the whole thing. She very quickly get it over, threw it in and quickly go out. Shy. But Jesus said, she gave more. She gave more. My question is, what was her motive in giving? I believe this was the motive. She wanted to do her part. She wanted to do her part and she wanted to obey God. Give whatever was in her heart. So her motivation was not for attention. Even she's so shy about attention. Jesus saw how she put in the money. You know, sometimes you sit in crusades and sit in public meetings. And you know, in most public meetings, we collect an offering to meet their expenses. Every time an offering time comes by, depends on where you're sitting. If you're sitting with a certain crowd, sometimes you begin to hear the grumbling. Ayya, 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 ula. You know? <laughs> as if, as if that <laughs> they were in pain and great travail and struggling. And not only that, all kinds of complaints. And yeah, I think this one uh, just worth two dollars. Uh. <laughs> Do you know God is watching? One day God will video video play for you. In heaven you'll be very shy. Eh? Blushing in heaven if they ever blush. Don't follow people who give without a good motivation. The best type of givers are what Paul says in Corinthians 9, a fearful giver. Those who gave because they love God. And you're just, hallelujah, it's offering time again. Praise God. See, your reaction to that kind of time actually reflect more on you than on the other ministry. It reflects more on the giver than on the receiver. So take note of that. I've been in many 
public meetings held in this country and many times I don't know whether it's a Malaysian attitude or what and it comes around that time you always hear some grumbling as if their money was really glued to their skin they had to peel it off with great pain to put it into the offering it's a real wrong attitude and this kind do not have blessing involved wrong motivation but people are filled with love and they give then we see Jesus in chapter 12 in verse 41, 42 many who were rich pretty much then one poor widow came and threw in two mites to make a cordon he called his disciples to him and said to them assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who are given to the treasury. Jesus looks at your percentage and not your amount. So for those who have 10,000, even if they give a thousand, for those who had a hundred dollars and they were giving ten dollars, it was still the same. God is not interested in just the amount he watches the percentage. In proportion to what he has blessed you, you are responsible to bring it unto God. The percentages. And as you grow, the percentages remain the same. And you can also increase the percentages. So it does not matter whether you are a school, school girl, school boy, and all you have is a little bit of pocket money every month and you're giving a couple of dollars every month as your time, your offering it does not matter even if you're in kindergarten or you're in, uh, and all you have is 10 cents and you give a 10 cents it's still okay because God is watching the percentage not just co concern of the amount that is why I feel very sad sometimes when people emphasize amount instead of percentages. And I feel sad when sometimes people say, let's collect a silent offering. You know what a silent offering is someone who gives today? Means no coin. No coin, no sound. So they call it a silent offering. But if they had collected a silent offering in Mark 12, the widow wouldn't have been in. And they didn't use dollar notes so there would have been an offering. I feel sad because silent offering is not giving opportunity for those who may have less. So we should not limit by the amount. We should let people flow according to the percentages. God watches the percentages. And let me add this. Don't be taken up by the figure. I don't care whether it's a hundred thousand, it's still ten thousand if it's one ten. But being human, when you think of twenty cents, thirty cents, fifty cents, and one or two dollars, it seems easier to respond. But when God starts blessing you until you have to be responsible to start giving ten thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, you think, I uh, this big amount. And what happens is many people start dividing their offerings. But when they have 50 cents, they don't divide it. You know what they do? They have 50 cents, they don't divide. They didn't say, 5 cents go to Maurice Cerullo, and uh, 10 cents go to Ken Aydin, I like him. They never divide. They just give wherever they have been blessed. Then when they reach $1,000, they say, this is too much for the preacher, you cannot handle it. Let me divide it, give us to 10 preachers a hundred dollars each. Then when they reach bigger, God start blessing them and they become millionaires. They say, oh, it's dangerous to give hundred thousand uh, at one shot. So they say, let's divide it, divide it. This is a uh, habit. Now if you divide according to the leading of the Spirit, that's fine. But if you divide just because you're thinking of the amount, that's wrong. You're not being led by the Spirit. You're being led by your mind. 
And in our mind, sometimes it's easier to obey in the smaller things than in the bigger things. When the amount starts getting bigger and bigger, we become reluctant to obey as easily. But yet it should not be. It should not be. You should flow as easily in the percentages. Makes no difference to God. If, if it's uh, 10% of a million dollars, it makes no difference as it's the 10% of a one dollar. In the sight of God, it makes no difference. So we have to watch out there. Our motivation. Our motivation. Final part. In our motivation, in chapter 12, verse 44. For they all put in out of their abundance, and she out of poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. The fourth point, God watches what you keep, not just what you give. What you keep for yourself, He watches. When you have more, you start keeping more. He watches. That is why I encourage people to set a standard and don't go beyond that. Don't go beyond that. Set a standard and when God starts blessing you more, learn to be a better giver instead of keep on raising, raising your standard. If you still go on uh, you know, simple, simple meals and sustain you, good enough. Whether you're a millionaire or you're not a millionaire, remain in that area. Keep your life simple. Don't increase your meal to a hundred dollar a day meal. Not only you will have a very fat meal, but you also have a very fat funeral very soon. Indulging in that kind of food. So we have to put a standard and not go beyond it even though you can afford. Listen very carefully, even though you can afford. That is why as a minister of God, I've always encouraged other ministers, we have to set a limit to the standard of our living. We cannot live be way down, otherwise we cannot show that God is able to provide and we cannot tell others. Cannot show by example that He is able to provide. Neither can we live way beyond the others because it becomes a stumbling block for others to come to know Jesus. It would be very hard to witness to someone about Jesus if you came in your three-piece suit and you drove your Mercedes to the squatter area there and you park your Mercedes there and then you step up on your Mercedes in your $300 suit. Went into that a uh, little squatter hut and uh, gave him a track printed with gold outline. Say, God loves you and I love you, dude. To a guy who doesn't have shoes, something wrong somewhere. So, I believe it not only applies to ministers, it applies to all Christians. We have to set, set a standard that minimizes our lifestyle, our standard of living. We must not go beyond to the area where I call it indulgence and adverse. Which is the point of just pure indulgence. And if you can afford a Rolls Royce, I would suggest that you drive something simpler and use that amount of money to turn off. That will be much, much wiser. So it does not mean that you cannot come to the level where you could afford it. You could, but you have set your own standard. The fruit of the Spirit is temperance, self-control. You don't want to go beyond that standard. You set a limit. Otherwise, when God starts blessing you, you start going beyond and not having the fruit of self-control, which is not good. So God watches what you keep. And as we end this second part, 
on the motivation of giving. Money, I want to make this statement, money has no value until you use it. No spiritual value until you use it to help others. In heaven, all your records of your good works are actually recorded there. And every one of them has to do with how you help another one. Rather than how you use it on yourself. As far as money is concerned. See, money has no... Has, it has value. I mean, it has the, the value that is given to it by the various governments. But the spiritual value only comes when you use it for others. Jesus saw the rich man in Mark chapter 10, sell all you have, give to the poor, and then the next statement Jesus says, you will have treasure in heaven. First thing, for all you have to do to have treasure in heaven, sell all he has and give to the poor and his treasures in heaven. See what we mean? The rich man has been keeping all this to himself. And he walked away sadly because he could not part from them. And what happened was he had no treasure in heaven. He had a lot on earth, but he had nothing in heaven. In fact, he may not even be there. So to have treasures in heaven, we have to use our possessions for others. We have to be very unselfish about them. And be unselfish about your possessions and knowing that all these things are to be used to love. I like one poster that says, Love people... Use things. Don't love things and use people. Then you'll be mixed up. In the world, there are some people who love things and use people. But we should love people and use things. Use things and finances and all that we have as something to make others better. Something to bless, something to help. And lift another one up unto God. So it has no value. If you have $100,000 and you spend $80,000 on yourself, that $80,000 may have value as far as money is in concern on this earth, but $80,000 has no value. But of all the $20,000 that you spend here and there, in various ways, you have given your time, then it has your spiritual value for the 100,000 is only 20,000. If, for example, you have given, if you have 100,000 and you have given 10,000 tithes and 10,000 offerings, and then of the 80,000, you only spend about 20,000 on yourself, and you have another 60,000 which uh, you use in various ways. You're still responsible, but you use in various ways by which people are being helped and people are being blessed. Then, of the 100,000, 80,000 has spiritual value. So what I mean is money in itself has no spiritual value. But how you use it makes it whether it has spiritual value or no spiritual value. It's important to take note of that. Otherwise, we will not know the secret of putting treasures in heaven. How many like treasures in heaven? We all like. Alright, to have treasures in heaven, you have to use your money unselfishly. The money that you use unselfishly will have treasures in heaven. So I, I love to give because I know every time we give, it is having treasure in heaven. We are having treasures in heaven for us. Some people, they are mentioned now, short of material. They are not sending enough material up there. Not exactly then, I'm just uh, saying, Sometimes it's like that. Not enough treasure in heaven. When they go up there, and Jesus said, I bless you a lot on this earth. Where are they? They say, oh, I use all them on this earth. Money has a way of whether making us more selfish or less selfish. See, selfishness and love are things that we develop as a fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Or a fruit of the flesh. Okay, selfishness. If we could use money in such a way which will cause us to be loving to others and develop 
then we have succeeded a lot because it's training ourselves to be less and less selfish. Training ourselves to be less self-centered. But if we use money self-centeredly, then we are in the end building our self-centeredness. And later it's very hard to come out of it. So the way we use money will also train our soul in love or in selfishness. So the third area that we are going to cover are the various laws of finances. There are many laws but we only record the basic laws because these are just basic foundations. And then to go further, we have 18 cases teaching on the laws of finances. 18 cases. And uh, we cannot touch to all these areas. We are going to just touch on the main foundation. The most important law that comes forth is the law of tithing. Some people say that tithing has been done away in the New Covenant, but they are missing it. Because we can ask this question, is tithing a blessing? If it is a blessing, the Bible says the blessing comes of the Old Covenant comes into the New. See, tithing is not just a ceremony. And tithing did not start in the time of Moses. Tithing started in the time of Abraham. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Way before the law came. And tithing was known by Isaac, was known by Jacob, who promised God one pen when he was having that vision in battle. He told God, you bless me, I will honor you by giving you one pen. So tithing was known by the old patriarchs before the law came. So it did not originate with Moses, like what people think. Tithing is something that God ordained as, as one of the things to move in. Now, you may try to over-spiritualize it and say, Oh, now in the New Testament, 100% of all I have belongs to God and you may end up not giving your tithe and you're going to read this section. Which is why I tell people, you have to make sure that you remove the tithe from you. The only way you can make sure is to keep an account. Because if you miss it, you hold back your tithe, the curse comes. Irrespective of whether you say, Oh, oh, all I have belongs to Jesus, all I have belongs to Jesus, but it remains in you, the curse comes on you. And so the law of the tithe is very exact. God says, remove it from you. It says it belongs to me. Turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 27, verse 30. And all the tie of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. The Lord says, the tie is holy. It is mine. Holy. And it's something that we better not play around with. You can try to keep all the other laws without keeping the law of the tie. You will never make a breakthrough because it's the first law. The laws are like various foundations. If you don't take the first step, you can never take the other step. You have to start with the first step. The most basic, which is the law of tithing. And you know, many people are not tithed. Not referring to here. But they have calculated in the whole world, Christianity, if all professed Christians die, the churches today would have even more than enough. So that shows there are not many times. You see the importance of it. The tie is holy. And if it's something holy, I would have to be careful to make sure it goes out. I don't want to play around it and just generalize the figures and say, oh, this is no more tithing, all are just offering. Well, you want to do that if you want, but if you miss in giving off your tithe, bring, give, uh, removing the tithe from you, all the other laws are stopped. All the laws are stopped. 
if you don't start this opening, it's the first, it's the key that it is just like a lot with many uh, uh, real turning. You need to turn the first part, which is a law of tithing. And many people change their tithes into various forms. Instead of giving the tithes as they are, they may say, oh, I think I would rather give tithes in other forms. And so they take the Thai money and they go and buy Milo, buy rice, and bring all these things to, to, the, to the people who need it and say, ah, here is uh, it's for you. Do you know what they are doing? They are redeeming the Thai without God's permission. If the Thai don't belong to you, you have no right to use it. You have no right even to decide when you want to give it. You, the moment you have it, you have to remove it from you. You have no right. That's why I tell you, if you are paid monthly, then you give monthly your tithe. If you are paid weekly, you tithe weekly. If you are receiving by project, which may be two, three months, once or so, then you tithe by project. As it comes, you tithe. You don't accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And then you, you have to remove the ties quickly. Remove the ties from you. The law of the ties. The ties belong to God. Malachi 3 verse 9 and 10 says that if you keep back your ties, you're robbing God. Now, robbing God is a serious crime. Do you know that when you change your ties, you're robbing God? I cannot come to your house and tell you, I want you to cook chicken curry today. Because it's your house and it's your chicken and it's your kitchen. I cannot just come and give you orders, right? It's wrong of me. And that's what you're doing. You're telling, uh, you're, you're saying, oh, I, I, I use your tie this, the tie this way. Although you may be the one who, who is giving a, bringing a tie, it is never yours. One pen belongs to God. And if you have ignorantly used it, God charges you 20%. Verse 31. If a man wants to at all to redeem any of his tie, he shall add one piece to it, which is 20%. Very high interest. And that is only for a reason. Not everybody is supposed to do that. If you read all the other passages on tithing, it talks about how some people, they, remember those days they used cattle. So for them, it's a long journey to drag the poor old goat all the way. And so, what God says is that they can change it in the form of money. When they change it, they have to add 20%. The moment you touch the tie, twenty percent is touched to you. Dangerous! Don't touch it. So I said, don't touch it. Belongs to God. God is a very serious banker when it comes to tithe. <laughs> and some people try to change it for Milo and uh, all these trying to redeem their tithe. Let me show you what happens here. It says in verse thirty-three, thirty-two, thirty-three. Concerning the time of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the ten one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchange it at all, both shall be the Lord. Dangerous. See, if you exchange and try to redeem the time without God's permission, that means, for example, you want to bring a hundred dollars. As time, that's your time. And as you're bringing, you say, no, I think, I think that that that, that minister there needs Milo and rice. Let me go and buy Milo and rice. And when you go and buy Milo and rice, both the hundred dollars for the Milo and rice belong to God. <laughs> that's what happened here. You try to redeem it. Everything belongs to God. God said, "That's holy. This is holy. Finish." You still have to pay all your hundred dollars plus a milo in the right. Dangerous to touch God's side. Don't play around with his side. It's not a law that you can subjugate and you can make a, a, a very low law to all the other laws. It's the first that he watches over. The law of the tide. 
And the word time means a ten. A ten. There's no way you can make it to be eleven. If it's nine point nine, it's not a tie. If it's eleven if it's ten point one, it's not a tie. It's exactly ten percent. Thank God he is ten percent is easier to count. This change the decimal point. So the tie does not belong to us. The law of the tie determines whether you are in the blessing or in the curse. That means that if you have a thousand dollars and you held back ten dollars, you can even hold back one dollar. You could even have been faithful to give ninety nine dollars, you are still holding back your time. It is not counted as time. And as long as you hold back even one cent, you can even give ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. You are still holding back the time. Because the word time means ten. That is why if you want to count, you better round it off bigger than lower. You know how that makes you round it off? You want to round it off, better round it off upward and not downward. <laughs> and the time will mean for example, if you have thousand dollars and you give a tie of bring a tie of one hundred dollars, it means that all your nine hundred dollars are is blessed money. It's anointed money. When you use it, there's a blessing. When you buy things, there's a blessing with the nine hundred that you have. And surprisingly, when you walk this way before, somehow your 900 goes further than before. Why does it go further? Because the blessing of God is inside. And when you hold back your tie, for example, your thousand dollars and you hold back your tie, you only get fifty dollars. It's not even considered tied yet. Surprisingly, all of your nine hundred and fifty dollars. When you buy this, something wrong with this one. When you use the money here, something wrong here. When you use the money, all the whole lump sum of nine hundred and fifty dollars. That's why the law of the tie determines whether you are blessed or you are cursed. See, each law determines something. You want to be blessed, be obedient. In the time, be obedient in the time. Second law is the law of offering. Chapter six, verse thirty-eight of Luke. So remember the time, and on some practical areas, when you're turning to the second law, the tie is not yours, it belongs to God. You don't simply cut up the time, give here, give there, give here, without consulting God. If you do it without consulting, everything you give plus the tie is cut to your account, plus 20%. I don't dare to simply give, bring my tie here and there. I pray and say, God, where do you want me to place your tie? This is your money. Just tell me where to put it. That's all. And basically, if you are at a stage where you cannot hear God very clearly, just bring it wherever your, your local church is. Or where you get your spiritual food. That's all. That's the basic law of God. It's your storehouse. God's storehouse. And the law of offering in Luke six thirty eight says, Give when it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the measure you use it will be measured back unto you. The law of offering determines the measure you receive. Take for example this bottle of oil. This is a large bottle, this is a small bottle. 
if I did this measure, it's going to come back in this measure. Same measure. If I give this measure, it's going to come back in the same measure. For Jesus said the same measure you use, it will be measured back unto you. So the law of the offering determines the measure you receive. If you are someone who has been giving in tens of dollars, usually the return comes back in tens of dollars. If you are someone who gives in hundreds, usually the measure that comes back is in hundreds. If you put a bag of rice, one kilogram, and you give it, it will come back in one kilogram, one after the other. One kilogram measure. Now God can multiply it, bring it unto you, but it usually comes back in one kilogram measure, one after the other. The measure you use. Don't fool yourself. Some people, they have great debt of thousands of dollars, and they bring a one dollar note and say, Brother, one dollar. You know, uh, I stole a seed fake for my one million dollar debt. What that one dollar? They're asking God to break. They're asking God to break His law. If a million dollars were to come to you one dollar at a time, you know, and if you have it once a month, coming at one dollar a month, you will need a million months to reach one million dollars. See, the length of time is longer. And so we have to be realistic to ourselves. If that's the measure, now you remember, the next time you give an offering, remember, that is the measure you're going to receive back. The same measure you use. And so what you do is you build your faith. I do not encourage you to jump. Do you know people who overstretch their muscles? They, their muscles snap. They have what I call uh, a torn ligament. And sometimes people overstretch their face and they have a torn face ligament. And they need to be hospitalized in the world. And uh, they need to be given the medicine of the Holy Ghost. Treated before they could revive. Some of them fainted and they go into a spiritual coma, which is backsliding. <laughs> He says, why it didn't work and they backslide? They go into the spiritual coma. And when we talk to them, no response. That's what people do. They're believing God for big sums. Thousands of dollars. But their giving is one dollar, two dollar, ten dollars. Ah. What? So be realistic. What is your level of giving is the same level of your receiving. Build it slowly and let it grow in your life. Let it grow in your life. Then we come to the law of saving. That's an important law because some people who live by faith don't have saving. Brother, I don't have saving, I live by faith. <laughs> and see, then I ask him, how do people give uh, offerings to you? Uh, does it always come in cold cake or does it sometimes come in check? Say, oh, sometimes it gives check. <laughs> but uh, what do you do with the check then if it's a cross check to you? Do you have any account? No, I don't have any account. <laughs> what do you do with the check? Yes, there's some account that it bang in. And people, as they progress, when they give large amounts, up to a certain point, it begins to be in di a different form. I mean, seldom do people give $10,000 in cash, they either give it in cash. 
So as you begin to deal with bigger and bigger amounts, your system of handling the money has to be more advanced. You don't expect God to give you $100,000 in cold cash. Usually, it, it can come to you, but it comes in tax or bank drop. You operate on a different system. It is still money, but it's handled differently. Nobody handles a million dollars, no, by Santa Claus. <laughs> you will be a real Old Testament guy. You are still handling it that way. Or rather, you will be having it the primitive way. And your bank is still your mattress. So there is a law of the saving. And there is a reason for that law. Let me show you from the word of God that God wants you to have a saving. Not just for the purpose of what people think, say to spend later. Or saving as a lack of trust and faith in God. No, I'm going to explain to you why the Bible shows you in that area. It's for different purpose and reasons. In chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, in verse 8, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. It is your storehouses. They had savings. Their storehouse, being farmers, the storehouse is their warehouse. It's where they store their access. Because it comes to them in season. The blessings that they receive are seasonal. When they have a harvest, they have to store it in their storehouse. That is their saving. They don't have it monthly, they have it seasonally. And so their saving, the law of saving, is so that when there is no harvest, they could make use of that saving. Because that, that which God blessed them earlier was supposed to last that long. The law of saving gives you, number one, staying power. Staying power. What do we mean by staying power? If you are on a salary, supposing that you receive a check and you leave hand to mouth, if your wage were to be delayed for seven days, it means seven days of puasa. Hai Raya Puasa. That would mean that you have no staying power, no stamina in that area. Now, staying power is important. Not even a savings account. Until God began to show me in His Word, say, I want to bless your storehouse, but you don't have a storehouse for me to bless. And sometimes, when we were in those days doing magazine, when somebody gave a check, a thousand dollars, or when you know, it was an outstation check. It took at that time 10 days to clear. And we, we need the money. And what do we do? We borrow early from some people first. And when the check clear, we return. Now, isn't that a poor testimony? Where is the staying power? Some people have no staying power. All you have to do is stop their paycheck. They'll be finished. If their paycheck gets delayed for one week, they are straight away in debt. They have to go to their what's that fellow called that? Chatia. The moment Chitia. 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 Wow. But it sounds more like Chitia. <laughs> the Chitia. So the moment your check gets delayed. Something gets delayed, your boss delays the payment. You go to that guy, straight away you get into debt. One week later, you pay him back, you have to pay with interest. Or oh, not to him, you have to go and put yourself in debt. And the Bible says, thou shalt not borrow. 
staying power staying power people do give offerings in time but it takes time to clear to the bank some of those things and if we have to depend just on hand to mouth we will be at a danger point all the time God doesn't want His people to live that way. So the first reason is for staying power. And staying power applies to your personal life and to your business life. That's why people who go into business without staying power, they are heading for doom. Because your business may take time to pick up. In that time, you have to make use of your staying power before the harvest starts coming in. See, it's staying power until the harvest comes in. Do you have staying power? You must have staying power until your harvest that you have planted comes in. And the second reason for the law of storehouse is that the, it helps you to operate the law of offering at a higher level. Example, I have, example, I have been giving tens of dollars. My biggest offering is $50. I've never given $100 to $200 at one time before. I've never given in that measure. So slowly, I've been keeping a certain amount in the savings. And the savings reach a point where it's about $200. So God began to speak to me <coughs> to take of the... to increase my measure. I'm giving in tens of dollars. This is the level that I'm also receiving. The same measure, you use the same measure, measure back to you. God began to speak to me about uh, offering. And then, I have a law of, I have the law of saving, operating. And I have uh, $200. God began to speak to me, uh, give 150 of those dollars away. So I draw it out and I give one shot, one measure, a $150 measure. Suddenly, I'm walking at this $150 measure. Can you see what it does to you? It helps you stretch the law of giving to your advantage. It helps to increase your giving. Some of you may never know what it feels like to give $1,000. Your giving may be in hundreds of dollars. But if you have a law of saving, you could probably have a small amount accumulating through the year. And you may end up with $1,500. Suddenly God tells you, give a $1,000. You have never done it before. Suddenly, you have been giving in the hundred, hundred. Suddenly, you pass the four-figure mark in giving. Your measure starts passing the four-figure mark in $1,000. You move in the four-figure measure suddenly. See what the law of saving can do for you. It helps you operate the law of giving at a higher level. And it it brings a faster increase to your life. <coughs> now in those days, when they had the storehouse, is where they store the grain. Part of the grain that they store is going to be used in the next harvest. And many times, there are special times that will bring a special harvest. Do you know there are, there are normal offerings and special offerings? You never know. Sometimes there may come a special time of sowing where there will be a very special blessing involved. Like for example, renovation. We don't do it all the time. But suddenly it comes. There's a sudden need. Or a missionary project that suddenly comes. Or a speaker, a guest speaker may come and talk about a missionary project to Tibet that nobody has done it before. And God may put a burden in your heart. Tell me, if you don't have the law of saving, how can you give? Now you see the reason? You've got no power to sow extra. It gives you a greater power in giving. Your giving ability increases by the law of saving. See, the concept of saving is different from what I'm thinking. That, that, that most of you, when I talk about saving, and most people start thinking in a worldly way. But the biblical way is, is a different reason. But it's still needed. Because from time to time comes special projects. And I have invested in special projects in God before. Where God has spoken 
and I have found that special projects have special blessings and return. And when it comes along, and you don't have any ability to even engage in it, for example, you have never had a law of saving, you only practice a law of tithing and giving, that, that brings you to just night. Through the years, you have never operated a law of saving. Suddenly, an evangelist comes to town. He has a project for Tibet. You are sitting there in the congregation. I wish I am able to participate in this. But you are not. You only could wish. But there are others who could participate. Why? Because they have some amount somewhere that they could draw out and invest it into that mission. So they get the blessing, not you. See what the law of saving does. It gives you the extra bonus, the extra boost that you may need in a time of special blessing. And they, those come and go from time to time. They come and go. And they always have a special blessing involved. Above the normal. It gives you the ability to participate in those special projects they come and go so the law of saving then the law of first fruit is in your notes there the law of first fruit that you have or have done saving first before first fruit first fruit Leviticus 23 Leviticus 23 the law of first fruit is a different law from the law of tithing. First fruit is the whole amount that you first receive. In the Bible, in Leviticus 23, in the law of first fruit, it says in uh, verse 10 and 11, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So the law of first fruit is what is first produced. It's the first sheaf. After the first sheaf, the first sheaf comes in uh, verse 16. Chapter 23, verse 16. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering. So the first fruit is something that leads to a bigger blessing. In those days, they depend on God utterly. When the first fruit is produced, it means the starting of the harvest season. So they want to ask God for the harvest season whole harvest. Do you know that in the middle of the harvest you can have pestilence? Your harvest can be cut in half by a storm, wrong weather. See, even though there is a harvest coming, your harvest can be stolen from you. So the first fruit is saying, God, I want your blessing also in the harvest. I got your blessing in the sowing. I want your blessing in the harvest. So that the whole harvest will come, I won't lose a single fruit. I won't lose a single grain. All of it shall not be lost. So the first fruit is given to God as an offering of more things to come. Saying, God, it is you and I, we are in partnership in this together. The first fruit is a symbol of more to come. That straight away you start worshipping God and say, God, it came from you, it's all yours. I acknowledge it is your blessing. That's the first fruit. The first time that you give the first fruit, it's actually a, like a hundred percent. But it brings you into a covenant blessing for the rest of the way. When Joshua went to conquer the land of Canaan, the first town that was conquered was Jericho. God said, all the gold and silver that is inside shall be mine. They are dedicated to me. The word dedicated refers back to first fruit. And Achan saw something and tried to take it. He got judged and he died. So the first fruit 
It's like a partnership with God. It determines the God being a partner in what you're going to do in your harvest. In the receiving end. And that law that you release before God, it takes some dedication. At first, supposing, this is only an example, supposing that they have conquered 50 cities after everything was over. Then it will only have been one out of 50 cities. One fifty that doesn't amount to that much in the end. It's only about twenty percent. And uh face less than that is uh two percent. Twenty two percent. If when they first gave it it was a hundred percent. See how the first fruit operate is different. When they first gave the first city to the Lord, all that was inside, it was a hundred percent. It was their first food, it was their first conquest. But that was telling saying, God, the rest is ours. That was saying God we expect the all the other harvest to come into. So the first fruit it operates differently. When you first give it, it's a hundred percent. And the rest is coming. It brings God into partnership with you. In all the ministries that we have started, we always have given the first fruit out. Brings God into partnership. And then a new grain offering. That means a continual thing. That means you have a covenant with God. A first fruit is a covenant with God. Where you covenant with God, it is above your tithe. It's above your normal offering. You covenant with God. You're saying God is going to be uh, another 10% above. I'm going to covenant with you uh, and make this into a partnership with you. In the New Testament, it becomes a partnership plan with God. A partnership plan with God means that it is a constant ground. A constant ground. And the ground are, and you are tied up. Because the ground and you are like part of the harvest together. And so, in that ground that you have together, there is a symbol of it in Philippians chapter 4, that he used the word partnership. See, sometimes people give their offerings, and even their tithe, one month they will put here, one month put there, one month put there, and I found that these people do not receive as much... uh, uh, blessings in finances as they would if they have known how to do it properly. What I personally do, I'm sharing for my life, is by observing. I didn't observe my own life. I observed, for example, like my wife, Amy, when she was in a seminary. There were certain people who supported her at that time and I observed how God started promoting them and blessing them. They constantly sent a certain amount. It was a small amount, but it was a certain amount to her. And then through the years, I observed that those who have become a partner in a ministry have received more blessing than they keep changing ground, keep changing ground, keep changing ground. They do not receive. You see, when I become a partner to another ministry, all the blessings of God through that ministry flow to me too. Because I become a part of that person. How can you be a part of something that you only give once in a blue moon? Even in the world today, you don't sign contracts that way. You don't have partnership that way. So to have a partnership operating for, for you, you have to be constant. And I have practiced that and I found it works. So I have a personal partnership with certain ministries. They can be assured that every month that amount is going to reach them. See, I have a partnership with them. They are responsible to pray for me in that area and I draw some blessings from their ministry to my ministry. And by doing that, I become a partner to them. This is the word Paul used in Philippians chapter 4 when he says in uh, verse 
15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. I want you to notice the word giving and receiving. Some of you are reading it as concerning giving. Do you see the word giving and receiving? But Paul never gave anything to the Macedonians. Paul never gave anything to the Philippians except his ministry. Why does Paul mention giving and receiving together? He's talking about partnership. The word shared with me is a Greek word for partnership. The same word that talks about how John and, uh, and Peter, James, John and Peter were partners together in their fishing boat before they were with Jesus. Same Greek word for partners. Here, Paul is saying that God has called him to do something as an apostle. And the Philippians have a part in Paul's ministry. They have an investment in his ministry. They have a partnership in his ministry and they were partner in giving and they were partner in receiving. That means all the blessings that Paul received, the souls that want through his ministry, they have a part in that blessing. Not only that, God looks at that and He begins to bless them too. So a partnership determines your giving and your receiving end. Together with the ministry you stand with. In the early days of my ministry, I never learned this law. I used to give here and there haphazardly. I was faithful in tithing and offering, but it was a haphazard one. It was not a constant to a constant department or ministry. It was haphazard. Until God began to speak to my life and say, if you want to have constant blessing coming to you, you have to give constantly. Say, all right, tell me who. And so God began to show, and I know exactly what to do, and even up to this day, I am faithfully partners with certain ministries in their life. And when that happened to them, as you do unto others, it's done unto you. The law of partnership operates in your life when you keep the law of first truth. The law of hard work, very simple. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 1, Meditate on the word of God and all that you do shall prosper. All that you set your hand unto shall prosper. Whatever your hand does shall prosper. Psalm chapter 1. Same with Joshua chapter 1. Verse 8, same with Deuteronomy 28. Your hand shall prosper. God bless the work of your hand. If your hands don't have any work, there's nothing for God to bless. God does not encourage laziness. God doesn't bless lazy Christians. All that your hands set unto shall be prospered. You have to be doing something with your hands. Today it means that you have to be doing something for God to prosper you. You don't sit down and just you know, sit down there somewhere and say, I'm exercising my faith. That's no exercise, that's pure laziness. There's nothing that you're doing and you say, I'm living by faith. I'm living by faith. That's not living by faith, that's living by faith. <laughs> Sitting down and just, go, just, you know, lazing away. We have to be doing something with our hands, with our feet, with our lives for the return. The law of hard work. And notice that part of the hard work is meditating. Do you notice Psalms 1? Meditate on the word night and day. Some of you don't realize it. But your meditation in the word is better than your investment in fixed deposits or anywhere else in share market or in, and in buying shares from a company. It is investment time. When you are meditating on the word, it's investment time. More than... The time that you invest in the word will determine the productivity of your hand. So if you want God's production to work on what you do, make sure you have an input of the word. You put one hour, it's not wasted time. That one hour is not only going to help you in your spiritual life, it's going to help you in your natural life. 
That is why if you are working on a job or a project or somewhere, don't think that, oh, I don't have enough time for the Word. You cannot afford not to have the time. If you don't have the time on the Word of God, what you're going to do is not going to be having the blessing called the work of your hands are going to prosper. It's not going to happen and your hands are going to work and work and work and not prospering but blistering. If you want your hands to prosper, then invest the word day and night into your life. It's an investment. See it as an investment, not as wasted time. Not only for spiritual life, your natural life itself depends on the word. So we conclude with the spirit of prosperity. See, prosperity is a spirit. And that spirit of prosperity has certain attributes. And the attributes I have listed down here. Wisdom, righteousness, love, joy, humility. These are attributes of the spirit of prosperity. Which means that if you violate these attitudes in your life, you will jam up the whole system of prosperity working in your life. It's just like putting water into your petrol tank. You jam up the whole system. So if you do not walk in love, you do not walk in the wisdom of God, you do not walk in joy, you do not walk in humility, you are going to jam up that system. I touch on all these points in great detail in the series 18 tips on financial series that so you can look at it further in detail. But these forces of love, joy and humility and righteousness, every one of them, I've given you scriptures inside that you can turn to them and read them in detail, that all of them relate to prosperity. All of them relate to prosperity. The humble receive grace from God. Grace receive promotion from God. God promotes the humble. Love is the keeping of all the commandments of God and cause you to be prosperous. Now let's conclude by reading Deuteronomy chapter 28. God says in verse uh, 47, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord will send against you, in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of all things. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Now verse 47 is a warning to them, saying that they are going to be blessed by God. And if they are blessed by God, and they do not, do not continue to walk in joy, walk in love, then it's going to jam up the whole system. No matter how they prosper, they're going to come back into poverty, nakedness and thirst and hunger. So the spirit of joy, the spirit of love, the spirit of humility, spirit of grace, all these are connected to prosperity, the spirit of righteousness. He who hides his sin shall not prosper. Walk in all this spirit of prosperity and you will be able to what I call maintain prosperity. You know some people cannot maintain prosperity. You give them a million dollars, they will kill themselves. And some people, they start being blessed in prosperity, they stop walking in love. Or they lose their joy. They get over anxious, carried, distracted by the world. The only way you could maintain your prosperity is by this spirit of prosperity. Spirit of joy, spirit of love, spirit of righteousness. If people today begin to be blessed mightily, millionaires in Christ, they lose righteousness. They begin to leave a law unto themselves. They will hate for destruction. So God is wise. God trains you in the spirit of prosperity so that you could maintain prosperity in your life. Praise God. Let's all stand on our feet and make this confession together. Say, Father God, we thank you that Jesus was made poor so that we can be made rich. We thank you, Father, 
and we receive what Jesus has done. We thank you for the laws that are revealed in your word. And we recognize that it's all because of the work of Jesus. So we receive the gift of Jesus, the grace of Jesus Christ into our lives. The spirit of prosperity, love, joy, righteousness, humility. We will walk in them. We thank you, Father God, that we will be faithful to remove the tie from our dwelling place. And we will be faithful in the laws of giving and in all the other laws. Show us, O oh Lord, how to operate the law of first fruit so that we can continually receive a harvest from you. We thank you, Father, for your blessing upon our lives in Jesus' name. Prosperity is ours. It has been given in Christ. So Satan, we speak to you in Jesus' name. Take your hands off our prosperity. In Jesus' name, we rebuke the spirit of poverty. Go from our lives in Jesus' name. We draw forth from you, Father God, the spirit of prosperity. In Jesus' name, we become one in Jesus, in union with Him. As Jesus was on this earth, so shall we walk on this planet earth with authority and with dominion. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's give Jesus a clap offering. Thank you, Jesus. And remember, next week is on demonology, so... Uh, just meditate on that. We will cover it also in one session on how to cast out demons and all those areas too. Praise God. God bless you.